Hey everyone, Justin here. This is my 1992 Bridgestone RB1 for Road Bike 1. And if you're not familiar, the RB1 is considered one of the icons of vintage road frames. I've been on the lookout for a fairly high-end steel vintage bike for quite a while. This one popped up on my, on my local Craigslist and I knew this was the one to get. So if you're really familiar with the RB1, you might recognize that Although the frame is in great condition, almost all of the other parts are not original. We have a threadless conversion. We have a bunch of really nice, actually, Dior parts. Um, we've got these bar and shifters. We've got 105 brakes. We've lost our original Shimano 600, and we've got this Mavic uh, 631 Starfish crank. And that's because the previous owner had some health conditions late in life. And although he had this frame for a really long time, he moved to this Starfish triple crank um, and, and made a bunch of changes to make it a better rider for him, and that's awesome. But now that it's in my hands, I wanna take it back pretty much to stock, but with a couple of very subtle period correct tweaks that I think are gonna make it pretty much awesome. So that Mavic Starfish crank that I mentioned includes this really interesting bottom bracket. And this was a discovery that I made after uh, starting to tear down this bike. These 610 bottom brackets are actually not threaded into the bottom bracket shell, but rather you face the bottom bracket shell, and this is a floating bottom bracket, which is awesome for frames that have corroded threads. It's also a really long lasting hub or bottom bracket, but it's not what I was looking for. So we did have a bunch of rust here in the bottom bracket shell. So after I took the uh, the bottom bracket out, did some rust remover, I also took it to a shop and had them actually uh, run a thread cutter through this and make sure it was really nice. Almost all of these parts, like I said, are not original. The previous owner actually did a fairly tasteful job of upgrading it and making it the right bike for them. But for me, looking to go back to a much more original Shimano 600 kind of road components build, pretty much all of these parts have to come off. But the interesting thing is, these are actually really nice parts. There's a bunch of old uh, Dior stuff here. That Mavic Starfish crank is an absolute icon. So a lot of good parts, especially on these old frames with non-replaceable dropouts. You always want to check that derailleur hanger. You don't want it. You don't know how many times this bike has been dropped. So this bike right here, because it's got these bar end shifters, which actually are original to the bike, or at least the bar end shifters, I don't know if these specific ones are, you really do have a kind of a rat's nest of cables up here. So I am going to be converting these back to down tube shifters. Obviously, the frame has bosses for down tube shifters, but that is not how it actually came from the factory. This was right at that transition period moving away from down tubes and bar ends and into the modern indexed brifters. But this bike still had bar ends because that's what its original designer was a fan of. The original designer of Bridgestone uh, bikes, or at least the face of Bridgestone bikes in the US was Grant Peterson. He now runs Rivendell bikes. So if you've heard of Rivendell bikes, those sort of vintage focused, little less, little less trendy bikes, if you will, in some ways, um, that, that was the guy who was the face of Bridgestone in the US. So this restoration is fairly easy compared to a lot of my other restorations where I was dealing with really um, dirty, damaged frames. This one is pretty much just going to be a take all the components off, clean up the frame, put the right components back on, and tastefully modify it up to sort of modern vintage, if you will. So right here, of course, we have the uh, the quill stem and the headset. So taking the headset off, you're going to notice if you look really closely here, these are caged bearings. Caged bearings are fine. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with them, but their primary advantage is actually in manufacture. It's much faster to drop a cage of bearings on compared to putting on individual ball bearings. The con is you don't get as many bearings because the cage itself takes space. So here you see I am just I'm basically going to get rid of the caged ball bearings and just put in my own ball bearings. You might even be able to tell you actually get quite a few more ball bearings in here. So it gives the headset a little bit more support. It's just a nice little thing. Like if you're already going to be like cleaning cages, you might as well just buy a $5 thing of 100 ball bearings and and replace them because the cages don't really have any value themselves. 
For those of you who've worked on these old style headsets, it's basically just a matter of making sure that the, the cone is tightened properly. It's easy. I am upgrading to a Nito Pearl, which is not original, but it is period correct. And it's just a nice little touch, I believe. This is, you know, originally a, it's got Japanese tubing. Um, it's not an NJS bike for those of you who are aware of what NJS is, which is its own ball game. Um, but I did think that this Pearl, uh, you know, quill stem was going to be a really nice touch. A lot of those threadless conversion kits like this bike had on here, they work perfectly fine. But I don't think even now that stems look quite as nice as these quill stems. Like, yeah, they weren't very adjustable. They had their own limitations, but they looked awesome, especially when you're going to pair it with a, another period correct Nito bar. So I did decide to go with some Nito bars as well, which of course matched the pearl stem perfectly. So these are Shimano 600 period correct dual pivot brakes. I'm also installing uh, dual pivot brakes Shimano 600 on there as well. This is the one new old stock part that I bought, which are some Shimano 600 down tube shifters. These are the eight speeds, which is cool because they have both fr uh, friction shifting as well as eight indexed speeds. Interestingly, the new old stock parts on these were only a few dollars more than a lot of the vintage parts. So uh, I guess depending on how you look at that, you might as well go for the new ones. So 30 years of crud here under these down tube bosses. The bike originally had bar on shifters, like I said, not down tubes, but of course any steel frame from the 90s is going to support down tube shifters and it's my preference versus bar end. So I decided to go ahead and just put these 600s on there. For those of you who aren't too familiar with uh, friction shifting, the front shifting is kind of nice because it actually has a spring in there as well. So when you are shifting up to the larger chain wheel, there's a spring that actually helps you out. So it's, it's called Shimano light action. It is very light action. It takes very little hand force to actually actuate these down tube shifters. It's a really nice system. This is the, uh, the newer version of the front derailleur. And then here we have some more anti seize and this is just going to be my little pitch for those of you who've been paying close attention to the video i've been using anti seize throughout grease is of course always acceptable for making sure that parts are going to be able to be removed down the road but ultimately grease will dry out so especially for bottom bracket shells anytime you're talking about the interface of two dissimilar metals for instance the steel frame and the aluminum seat post this right here, anti-seize, is going to make it so that in 20 years, this seat post is going to come out no problem. So if you've got a choice, I would prefer anti-seize for those kind of applications. I recently built out a really nice modern frame, my Time Alpe d'Huez, and of course, as much as I absolutely love that frame, I will say there is something very nice about dealing with standard brake housing, non hydraulics, not having to do with dot fluid, just running a cable, taping it down, cutting a, uh, cutting a cable to length, and it works. It's great. Of course, I always like to use these little rubber stoppers here to stop the, uh, the cable from hitting the frame. I know a lot of people leave those off. Of course, they're optional, but stops those little scratches that add up over the years. Now, this frame is not in perfect condition. There are scratches on the frame. You might even be able to, yeah, see there's a scratch right there. Um, I don't touch those up. I'll do a little paint correction later, but um, just the way I restore bikes, I really, really value original paint. It's just become a thing for me, and I just don't like making a 30 year old bike look like it just rolled off the showroom floor. I try to get bikes that are already in decent condition, but I'm not bothered by some scuffs. So this is a Tanga uh, LN3922, I believe, bottom bracket. Again, some anti -seize. Um, This is my replacement because due to the spindle length, that Mavic bottom bracket that I pulled out earlier is not going to work. But like I said, I went to the bike shop. I had them run a park tool. Uh, tap through these threads to clean them up 
And uh, this Tanga bottom bracket is going to work perfectly. It's still a sealed unit. There's not like I don't have to actually adjust the bearings in here versus, you know, older cup and cone style bottom brackets. But that's a nice little upgrade. This is my one concession is I did add a period correct eight speed uh, Dura Ace front uh, front chain ring uh, as always torque to yield. Um, and the reason is I just I wanted to. That's that's the reason I wanted to. Uh, I, I thought it looked really nice. I will say for as much as I love the Shimano 600 group, the Dura Ace crank, I actually really just slightly prefer the look of. Um, yeah, apparently I became every bike manufacturer ever and put a higher end crank on than the rest of the group, but I liked it in the end. I think it looks I actually think it looks really good. Um, that generation of Dura Ace and Shimano 600 slash Altegra, I think looks really great together. Longtime viewers might recognize this saddle. This is a Brooks Swallow. Um, I actually stole this from myself off of another build. Um, I just thought it was going to work better on this bike, so I threw it over here. Let's talk about bar wrapping for a sec, because I know it intimidates a lot of people. Um, and yeah, it's hard. You know, once once you do it 20 or 30 times, it gets it gets pretty easy. But one of the biggest little tips that I would have is um, before you start wrapping, take some bar tape and just try to pull it apart and reel and learn for that specific tape how much force it's going to take to actually tear the tape it's almost always way more than you think and that'll give you the ability to really put some force into that tape get it nice and tight on your bars and that'll really help with a clean wrap um this is my next biggest tip i absolutely love this this is self-fusing silicone tape so of course i wrapped the end of the bar tape with electrical tape just like everybody but self-fusing silicone tape it does what it sounds it sticks to itself and it does not stick to you it's not sticky it doesn't unstick from anything it's amazing so this won't come undone in the heat. It won't get sticky in the sun. It's not going to make your hands gross. Uh, and it, it finishes gloss. And I think it just looks fantastic. I run self-fusing silicone tape on all of my bars. Uh, for chain sizing, I'm doing the big, big plus two technique, which basically means you run the chain over the big chain ring and the big cog in the back, add two links. And that's pretty much going to be a perfect chain length. In my experience, at least with these vintage frames, it's always been correct. Um, I think I did it differently on my SRAM Access bike, um, but yeah, this works great. This is the one mistake I made. I hand polished this frame earlier and I thought it was gonna be good enough, but I also machine polished another frame that I'm working on and I loved the results of it so much that I wanted to do it to this frame too, even though it was like 90% built. So I basically sucked it up and was like, all right, I'll hit the good, the, the main parts of this frame. And I'm happy I did because the paint, oh my God, it looks so good. Um, but I should have just machine polished it earlier. I always like to put a sealant on my on my bikes. It's it's like wax, but it's it's not wax. It's a sealant. A very small amount, the amount you saw on the pad is enough to do the whole bike. Just get a film of, of sealant on there for this kind, at least let it sit for 30 minutes and then wipe it off. It will keep the bike cleaner in the future. It doesn't do anything about scratches, corrosion or anything like that, but it helps prevent dirt sticking. So this is where I ended up and I am so happy with it because it's not an exact reproduction of the bike as it came off of the factory, but it's not a resto mod. It takes it back much closer to what it was intended to be with some nice period correct parts, a nice little corn cob cassette in the back, 5242 up front, down tube shifters, dual pivot Shimano 600 brakes, eight speed Shimano 600 indexed rear derailleur. Uh, and I'm just really excited to get this bike back out on the road. I've, like I said, I've been looking for a high end steel frame for a long time and this is the one that I want to ride. I, I, I came in with an open mind of what I would get. And, and when I saw an RB1 for sale, I was like, yeah, I, I have to get an RB1. Got the Japanese tubes, a nice collection of parts. And it's just going to work for another 30 years. Hope you loved it. If you have any questions, let me know. See you on the next one.